We have started, but there's no one here yet. So, uh, you know, I guess I'll just talk to myself like a crazy person for a little while. We're live on Instagram, you know what I'm saying? So shout out to all the Soapbox team. Big up to everyone out there isolated right now. And uh, here we go. Look, we've got our first person in the room. Big up to Dizzy. Is that Dizzy D? Yeah, it is. Yeah. Okay, so I'm going to uh, look. The, the phone with the Instagram is kind of over there. I'm having a little bit of a hard time seeing it um, in terms of reading who's there. But uh, big up to all of you lot out there locked on. Shout out to what I once again to the Soapbox team. Um, you know, these are crazy times that we're going through right now. Everyone's trying to do their thing to maintain some sort of semblance of normality, earn a living, just, you know, do the things that keep us sane. You know what I mean? So um, we've got a whole host of things going on with this, you know, behind the scenes with the Soapbox team. Big up to anyone that's been getting involved with the, the the live sessions that we've been doing. You know, we've got workshops about podcasting, games design, uh, music production. Uh, and I'm here to talk about DJing today, you know what I mean? So I'm, w I'm with you guys for the next hour. I've taken over the Soapbox uh, Instagram page. We are also on Zoom. Uh, if I won't be able to interact too much with the Instagram right now because, like I say, the phone's up there and I'm kind of having a hard time seeing it, you know. I'm an old man now, you know what I mean? But anyway, look, welcome to The Loft. This is uh, my home studio. Shout out to my cat over there, Billy. I don't know if you can see Billy. She's chilling. Um... Yeah, I call it the Fortress of Solitude, you know what I mean? Because I'm all about that Superman life. Big up to all my comic book characters, uh, comic book fans out there. So anyway, look, we're here to talk about DJing. And um, today's session, it's really just an introduction. Overall, we're going to be running this for like the next six weeks. The idea is that I, I'm aware that so many of you don't have kit at home, um, which makes it difficult to to teach you how to DJ if you don't have the equipment to to practice on so this isn't necessarily a tutorial it's more just gaining an understanding of what it is to be a proper dj and the variety of different types of djs the different styles of music there are out there the different roles um so so today it, it's it's step one right so first and foremost um uh, Big up to everyone that's getting involved, and uh, I, I hope you stay with us for the hour. And uh, let's talk about the equipment. So, like I say, I'm here in the loft now. This is my private studio at home. As you can see, I've got stacks and stacks of vinyl. Uh, that's how I started as a DJ, um, just generally as a music fan first, buying music. And um, I know that's kind of an alien concept to a lot of people nowadays in that, you know, we live in like a streaming culture now people don't really buy music like they used to whether it's digital or hard copies but step number one if you're going to be a good dj you really you've got to have a music collection and not just have a collection but know it you know and what i mean by that is uh you know it's all good and well having like thousands and thousands of mp3 files that you downloaded or whatever but if you don't have an understanding of the music in terms of what kind of vibe the track is, the arrangement of the tracks, you know, intros, outros, where the breakdowns are, y you're going to struggle to DJ with them. And this is something that you can't just be taught. This is something that you have to almost learn for yourself. It's, you know, I, the way I, got, uh, you know, accrued this collection, many years, many years of buying vinyl. And it didn't happen all at once. You know, you buy a few records at a time. And because that, because of that, you would go home and, you know, you would listen to them and you would get to know them, you know. And over the years, you know, you get to know all of your music in much the same way. And it's the same with digital. You know, if you download music, take the time to listen to it, get to know it. And uh, we'll, we'll get into that a little bit more in terms of, prepare, how, you know, how to prepare a set where you can find your music. Um, step one. It, okay, so... I'd say 50% of being a good DJ is just having the music, you know. You you can have all the technical skills in the world, but if you ain't got music, then, like, what are you going to do? You know, if you get booked for a gig, you know, you can't turn up with no music collection, you know what I mean? You can't be borrowing music off people. You've got to be prepared. And it's, you know, you've got to have a variety of styles. You've got to be prepared for all eventualities. Now, people know me as a hip-hop DJ. Shout out to the chip shop in Brixton. That's one of my favorite residencies. I play there all the time, or rather I, I was playing there all the time until the lockdown came into effect. And also, you know, I do the chip shop radio show. Now, of course, you know, chip shop is known for its hip-hop, but the, the 
the basic principles of DJing, whatever kind of music you're playing is transferable. You know, firstly, like I say, have a music collection. Know what that music collection is, understand your music, and understand where and when it's appropriate to play that music, you know. But then, uh, you know, having the music is one thing, but then you've got to have the equipment. So uh, the, the aim of today's session is really just to introduce you to the concepts, what I've got out, laid out here in front of me. This right here, this is my golden setup. This is what I love to DJ with. A pair of 1210s or 1200s, Technics all day, you know. Uh, I've got a Vestax turntable over there, um, and I've got a Pioneer CDJ as well. And, um, you know, more and more nowadays, people are using digital technology for DJing with, you know. Uh, what I'm using right here is a hybrid of analog and digital technology. Now, what I mean by that is that these are these are standard turntables, you know. These are designed to play records. They're designed to play vinyl, you know. So, you know, old school traditional vinyl, you throw it on the platter and away you go. Um, but this mixer is uh, one of Pioneer's latest flagship mixers. It's called the Pioneer DJ MS9. Now, I love this mixer. So it offers all the functionality of, um, oh, who's this? Earth to Tom UK sent a request to be in your live video. Sorry, Tom, I can't share the video time. Yeah, it's not my Instagram page. Uh, I'm taking it over for the day. So, well, for the next hour. Uh, I can't let you join in. But if you want to ask questions, uh, I think there's a thing here. Wait, hang on. Has someone asked a question? Uh, I don't know. All right, I'll try and I'll try and keep up to date with that. But anyway, look, where was I? So this is Pioneer's latest mixer. They've got a new version of this one getting ready to drop. But the idea with this mixer, it, mixer, it offers all the standard functionality that you would expect from a traditional analog mixer in that it's got analog inputs for your turntables so you can play vinyl normally. It, this is a two-channel mixer, channel one, channel two. Um, and, you know, for all intents and purposes, <clears throat> you could use it exactly like you used to use your old school standard mixers. But with the evolution of the technology, things have moved on a great deal when it comes to what's available out there. Yo, big up to Rain of Fire. I see you. Uh, <laughs> Rain of Fire. Rain of Sire. My bad. Um, this mixer is designed to work in conjunction with a bit of software called Serato. Um, I don't know how much you know about Serato. If uh, if you're in the Zoom page, I've got two cameras set up. I've got one looking straight at me so you can see the decks. And I'm sharing my laptop over here so you can see my Serato screen. Uh, don't judge me about my playlists, you know. But <clears throat> if you're not aware of what Serato is, basically it allows me to connect my laptop to the turntables. And... Um, rather than using actual vinyl, like traditional vinyl, to play the records, you know, um, the music is actually coming off of the laptop. Now, uh, I don't know if I can... Yeah, hang on. If I, if I bring this round here. Oh, no, my cable's not long enough, sorry. I don't want to uh, chance breaking anything on the first day. Hang on, let's... Uh so you've seen that, you've probably seen that. You know, so I've got a virtual left and right turntable there. And uh, what Serato allows me to do on a very basic level without getting too much into the functionality and the special features. And it basically just allows me to load up music from my laptop and use the turntables to DJ with it in a way that I would have with a normal record. So let me just grab this mic stand a second because I need to free up my hands. All right. Okay, so um, this uh, this bit of Superman vinyl here, this is a traditional piece of vinyl, like any other bit of vinyl. But rather than having music pressed on it, it's uh, it's what we call a time coded signal. I've I've customized it with the Superman tag, like that's how it looks normally. So if I was to just play this record without any you know connection to the laptop, this is what you would hear.
You know what I'm saying? So it's just it's just a, a high pitched tone, but that's what we call a time coded signal. And what that signal is doing is uh, the the laptop is interpreting that signal to tell it how far along the record the needle is, the rate of spin, all of that kind of stuff, you know. And the laptop interprets that information. And then if I load up a track onto that, so now I'm going to switch back over to digital. Uh, why ain't it working? <laughs> oh, hang on. Settings. Let me uh, sort my settings out here one second. So Serato allows you to control it. Oh, there we go. There we go. Serato allows you a bunch of different options on how you want to control it. Um, it asks you, are you using CDJs to control it? Are you using turntables to control it? And nowadays, of course, there are controllers as well. You know, so um, I, I, cut, I had it set on CDJs. So I've just switched it over to vinyl. So now if I use this record... That's loaded. Uh, oh, here we go. Sorry, lost connection there for a second. So anyway, the music is coming from the laptop. It's loaded into so it's loaded up onto Roto, loaded up onto the turntable. But then also the mixer allows me a certain amount of functionality to interact with Serato in that, you know, I can, uh, of course, I can just use the laptop like I would normally use the laptop, go into playlists and load things up. But I'm not one of these DJs who likes to... I don't like having the laptop in front of me when I'm DJing. I like to have it off to the side because I want to be able to make eye contact with my audience. I don't want to be hiding behind a screen. So one of the good things about this mixer is they've built in control functions that allow you to browse your library off of your laptop. I can scroll and pick a track and then... Uh, load something up uh, you know just at a touch of a button but then also we've got these buttons here these pads um shout out to akai if you know who akai are they uh they they famously make uh, the mpcs the drum machines you know the sampling machines and um, they've got some of the best pads in the game so pioneer went to them and got akai to uh, license their pads to them so that they could use them in the mixer now these pads are multi-function in this case what i'm doing is um they're they're marked up on cue points. So at the moment, these are all just scratch sounds. So if I press the first one. And I've got a load set up there. You can have up to eight cue points, we call them, labeled to. You with me so far? So I am kind of making the assumption that anyone watching right now is already a DJ and has a basic understanding of how this kit works. But if you don't, um, let's just run over that real quick. Now, as I mentioned earlier, this is what we call a two channel mixer. What that means is, is um, you can have, you know, two different inputs running at the same time. Most club setups will have what we call a four channel mixer. Pioneer is pretty much the industry standard when it comes to mixers and DJ equipment these days. So when you go into a club, you're likely to see a four channel mixer. And there are DJs out there that use four turntables. Uh, but also what that's good for is one, if you're a DJ playing just using two of the channels, the next DJ on after you can set up on the other two without interrupting with what you're doing. Um, a lot of these mixers that have Serato built in, they it's a USB cable that runs from the mixer to my laptop and it actually allows for two different computers to be connected at the same time. So at the flick of a switch, I can switch to a separate a different laptop, you know. That's that's really helpful. Um when Serato first started, in, hang on, let me let me it, it was an external box that you had to plug in and you could only plug in one laptop at a time and uh uh, yeah, it, uh, it's over there in the crate. I'll go and get it in a minute. I'll show you what I'm talking about. But it was a real pain to swap over DJ. So this has made life a lot easier, you know. Um, but just looking at the mixer, there's certain fundamental basics about every mixer that is the same, whichever mixer you're using and, uh, you know, whatever brand it is, whether it's two-channel, four-channel, the, the, the essentials are the same. So... Starting at the bottom of the mixer, this mixer is what we call a scratch mixer. It's designed for scratch DJs. So everything is up the top end. Like this whole bottom area is nice and chill. There's not much. Go there's nothing going on down here that's going to get in your way or block you when you're 
when you're trying to do your thing, right? So big ups to Pioneer for the clean design. Um, it's kind of based, it's very similar to the, uh, you know, Rain and Vestax's old mixers, but it's a scratch mixer, right? But um, these three faders right here is where a lot of the action happens, yeah? So this is a volume fader, right? So as it comes up and down, of course, <laughs> quieter and louder. <laughs> and uh, same for the other turntable. Have I got something on there? Oh, hang on. Can't see the other turntable on the Instagram, but there is another one. So you've got the two channel faders, channel one, channel two. This channel one is what this turntable is plugged into. The channel two is my other turntable. And it's a, it's a gradual fade, like it slowly gets <laughs> louder, yeah? Um, at the bottom here, we've got the cross fader. And it essentially just goes across the decks. When it's all the way on this side, you can only hear that deck. When it's all the way on that side, you can only hear that deck. But if it's in the middle, you can hear both. Now, you can set what we call the curve of the faders. Now, what I mean by that is how quickly or how sharp the volume is at its fullest. So with the, the volume faders, it's kind of a gradual fade, a gradual curve. It slowly gets louder. <laughs> and it's not the loudest until it gets to its top, right? The cross fader, I've basically turned to an on and off, whereby just moving it slightly <laughs> is at its fullest volume. What that allows you to do is uh, there's a technique called transforming. So when you're tapping the fader and moving this back and forth, you see what I'm saying, right? So um, that's the bottom half of the mixer. We've already spoken about the pads. These have got other functionality. You've got choices here. Uh, we'll get into that once we start doing a bit more complicated stuff. But um, that's essentially where the action happens, right? But also, as you look at the top of the channels, we've got an effects unit here. These are built-in effects that are inherent to the mixer, controlled by the hardware. And then there's an option over here with some extra buttons that allows me to access effects off of my laptop. But these these knobs at the top, this is this, it's really important to to understand how to use these. Yeah. So firstly, you've got um, let me uh, switch this over. So if I play this beat. You've got three dark grey knobs there, yeah, and they represent the EQ, yeah. Now, most of you should know what EQ is. If you don't, let me just run through that real quick. Basically, sound is made up of frequencies, yeah. You've got low frequencies, high frequencies, and mid frequencies. So low, mid, high. If you think of it like a clock face, currently, yeah, let me uh, adjust the camera a little bit. There you go, that's better. You can see more of what's going on. So the bottom most one is the low, the middle one is the mid, unsurprisingly the top one is the top. Now I the, I have them set at like 12 o'clock, if you think of it like a clock face, they're all set at 12 o'clock. What that means is that um, you're not really changing anything, that's how the track came, that's how the track was made. And uh, you can either take away or add to it, right? So the low is the bass, so turn that down, takes it away. Or you can add to it, you can make it bang harder, right? You know, we're hip hop heads, we like to add a bit more bass, you know. Then, uh, same for the mids, if you take out the mids, you're still left with the low and the high, you still got the hi hat and the kick, but that low frequency, the, the middle frequencies are gone. Or again, you can add to it. And then finally, the highs, if you want to dull down the sound a little bit, take out the hi hats, or you can turn it up and make them brighter. Where this comes in really useful is when you're mixing two tracks together, one over the top of the other, because you don't want frequencies to clash. Um, it, it can, it sounds terrible for a start, but also it can overload your sound system, and that's the last thing you wanna do. You wanna be, you know, within the parameters of what the sound system is capable of, and if you overload it, um, another good indicator as to whether you're overloading it is the LEDs that bounce up and down. Now. There is an old saying in DJing, which is, uh, if you're not redlining, you're not headlining, yeah? And what they mean by that is that you bang it so loud that the meters are all the way up in the red. I hate that style of DJing, and as a sound engineer, it breaks my heart when I see people doing that, because it's so bad for your sound system. Um, and, you know, it, it, 
if everything's turned up to the max, then you don't have room to manoeuvre because not all music is made at the same level. If you want to be able to mix one track over the other and this one is turned up to the fullest and this one needs to be louder than that one to achieve a good mix, now you're stuck, yeah? So think of the, uh, the LEDs as like a traffic light system, you know? If they're in the green, you're all good, yeah? If they're hitting the ambers, the yellows, exercise caution. That's kind of the area where I like to live. Just dipping into the yellow a little bit, right? Um, if you start hitting red, that's what we call clipping. And you, as a DJ, you don't want to be clipping because again, as I said, first it distorts, it can ruin the sound, but also you run a real high risk of um, actually blowing the sound system up. Now, what I mean by that, you know, it's not like some sort of comedy movie where boom, it explodes and you know, there's a puff of smoke and uh, you know, it doesn't happen like that. What will happen is you'll be playing, you'll be vibing out. You're like, yeah, 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 yeah. And then boom, everything just turns off. And you're looking around, scratching your head like, what happened? What happened? And you've got an angry sound guy at the back of the venue coming, storming over because you just blew up their 50 grand, like like 50K turbo system or whatever. You know what I mean? So you don't want to be that. You don't want to be that DJ. You know what I mean? You know, be sensible. The, the way the sound systems are designed is if you're not achieving enough volume from your output, they can crank it up from their internal system. They can turn the amps up. They can turn the soundboard up, you know. So don't feel... I know, like, some DJs get carried away, you know, when you're boosted, when you're vibing, and you, like, it just... You see it. Like, I see it when I record my sets. They start off at a certain volume, and they just get louder and louder and louder and louder, you know, because you're getting gassed, and each next tune is louder than the last one, you know what I mean? So... That's not good practice. Keep an eye on your levels and it will give you a nice, clean, consistent mix. Now, there are a bunch of other buttons on here. I'll just quickly run through them. This one over here, this allows me to switch between am I using my laptop? Is it the secondary laptop? Am I plugging in a CDJ? Am I plugging in a turntable? So my input select, in other words, right? Um, the knob underneath it. On Pioneer's four-channel mixers, this light grey knob you'll generally find above the EQs. This is what we call the trim, you know, or the gain. What the, what the gain allows you to do is it sets your roof limit for how loud your fader can go, right? So it's like a volume knob as well. So if I leave that fader all the way up, play the track, but then I can turn it up and down from here, right? And this will never go louder than what I, than what I set that to. You see what I'm saying? Yeah. That's also handy when you're in the mix. You might find that you need to boost your signal a little bit or you might find it's too loud, so you bring it down. Um, and that's the same on both sides. This button here, uh, this knob here, this is uh, a built-in filter, which is, a, again, it's built-in hardware on the mixer. Um, depending on what mixer you're using, the location of this may vary. Uh, the, some of the four channel Pioneer mixers have them underneath the EQs, uh, so that depends on the model, you might have one per channel or you might just have one overall one and you allocate the channel from a switch. But you know what a filter is, yeah? So you can either filter out the high frequencies or the low frequencies. So if we filter out the high frequencies, it kind of gives you that waiting outside the club vibe, hang on. You know what I'm saying? And then you can sweep it back up. That's called a low pass filter. In that it filters everything except for the low. And then a high pass free, uh, filter is the opposite. It filters everything except for the high. So if we work our way clockwise on this. So when you see these DJs and they're, they're twisting the knobs and they're, they're like, that's what they're doing most, most often is they're messing with the effects. So you can, if you think about the timing of the track, you can do it in time with the beat. You see what I'm saying, right? Uh, that can come in especially useful when you're blending two tracks together. You can filter one in, filter the other one out. Uh, yeah, you know, I'll give you an example of that in a minute. Uh, just the last bit over here, 
this is a loop functionality. We, we won't really dip into that just yet. Um, we'll, we'll, just, we'll sort of stick to the basics. Last couple of ones, you've got your master volume here. So you've got independent control over each channel, how loud they are, but then there's your overall volume, which is what the what the, the main audience is hearing. So, you know, what you guys can hear. So if I turn this down, you, you know, when I turn that down, you can't hear me. That's my master volume. Uh, this is my booth volume, which is actually what I'm feeding the phone with for the Instagram feed. Uh, we're going to get into it in one of the, uh, the later seminars, talking about how to set up for live streaming. This is something that's happening a lot right now, where so many DJs are in lockdown, all the venues are closed. Hang on, let me, let me call this. All the venues are closed. So there's, there's no gigs right now, but a lot of DJs are doing their thing online. So we are going to cover how to set up a live stream, you know. So, uh, yeah, you know, we're making progress here. Hopefully you've got a better understanding of what's uh, going on with the mixer. So just a quick recap. These are your channel faders, the volumes for each turntable. This is this turntable. This is this one. And then you've got your cross fader that goes between them. You've got your EQs starting at the bottom. That's your low, your bass. Then you've got your mid frequencies and your high frequencies. You've got your input select. And then you've got your gains. Yeah. Now, if any, of the, if I'm going too fast, if you've got any questions, uh, you can holler at me, send me a message, and uh, I'll go over it again. If you need me to slow down, just say something, you know. And um, yeah, you know, we're gonna be, we're gonna upload these videos to YouTube afterwards, so you can always go back and have a look another time, you know. Uh, right. One thing I haven't got to just yet is this section here. Now, this is my effects unit on this mixer. It's it varies from mixer to mixer how they set up their effects units. On the traditional Pioneer mixers, it's mostly a push button option. Like press this button to turn the effect on, press that same button to turn the effect off, and you know, you allocate an effect to a channel. This mixer has kind of been built with scratch functionality in mind. So we've got these, uh, I don't know if you've ever seen, uh, hang on, let me see if I can pull this over. No, no, the cable's not long enough. But Pioneer do standalone effects units, which you can plug into any mixer. And they have um, these, uh, like, paddles on them. These are spring-loaded paddles. So the, the idea, the way it works is... Um, okay, so if I pick Echo, for example... Uh, why isn't that working? Put the needle on. Right. Okay. So, like, with the all effects, the timing is important. Now, Serato, because it's connected to the mixer, it's feeding it information about the BPM of the track. So if I echo a track, it will automatically be in time with the track as long as we've set up the BPM correctly on the laptop. I'll get into that later. Uh, on a lot of the original mixers, you had to tap out the tempo. There is a tap button here. Now, what I mean by tap it out, I mean that, like tap along to the beat, yeah? So, like, one, two three, four, and there's a BPM counter on here, which will tell you what your BPM is reading at. So, if I use the echo, you see, you hear the echo, right? Now, this is the volume of the echo, how much echo there is. So, right now, I've got it turned all the way down. You can't hear any echo. Turn it up just a little bit. Now, the timing of the echo is slightly out because my tap wasn't exactly right. Uh, if I turn it back to automatic, it takes the B BPM information from the laptop, which makes it a lot tighter. So now... So I can turn the echo up further and further. The way this works is when that paddle is up, it's locked on, right? But it also has a spring-loaded mode, so it, you can pull it down to activate it, and then when you let go, it springs back. So using that in real life is like this. And if you want to get creative with it, you can uh, combine the filter as well, you know what I mean? You see what I'm saying, yeah? Now, there's a choice of four different um, effects built into this mixer. First one is echo, the other one is backspin. Uh, you've got flanger, love that word, flanger. Uh, reverb, 
vinyl brake, and then phaser. Uh, I'll run through them quickly so you can hear the difference, right? So you you already know what echo does. This is echo. Backspin is this. You know, I can do that myself. Uh, flange is a good one. Then reverb. Uh, vinyl break. That's handy if you're not actually using turntables. If you're using like CDJs or a controller or something like that, that comes in handy because I've actually got a vinyl break. <laughs> you know what I mean? And then the last one is phaser. Kind of similar to the flange effect, messes with the frequencies. And you see how it's dipping in and out? You can set the period of how long you want that to last. So if you, if I currently it's set to four beats, if I change that to one, and then two, three, and then four gives you the longer one. And you can go up, it goes four, eight, you know. So, oh, I got one, two, four, eight, 16, 32, yeah. And it goes all the way down to a quarter. Hopefully you're all keeping up with me so far. You know what I'm saying? If you've got any questions, you can holler at me. So that's like the basic functionality of the mixer covered. And what you will find is that much of this is the same regardless to what equipment you're using. This is, like I say, the Pioneer DJ MS9. It's designed to work with Serato. If you use Traktor, I know Traktor have got a variety of mixers out there. Pioneer seem to, like, Serato seem to have the game sewed up, if I'm honest with you, because that seems to be the one most companies are going for in terms of incorporating it directly into their hardware. Pioneer, pretty much all of, in fact, all of the new Pioneer mixes offer some sort of Serato support. Um, Rain, they're another one. They've got their own equivalent of this mixer. It's called the 72, and it's essentially the same mixer, just a different company. And uh, more and more companies who are bringing out mixers. Newmark just bought out a really decent low-budget mixer. I think it's like 400 quid. It's called the Newmark Scratch. Uh, it doesn't have eight buttons. It's only got four, but for 400 quid, man, like this is an 1,800 pound mixer. Um, but if you're just getting started, I strongly recommend that Newmark mixer, the Newmark Scratch. So, fundamental understanding of the mixer. Hopefully you guys are all still with me out there and uh, get what we're talking about. Now, the turntables. When it comes to turntables, there's a variety of options out there as well, like there is with your mixer. But to me, there's nothing like a Technics turntable. You know, I know Pine Technics, they discontinued their, uh, the turntables a couple of years ago and Pioneer stepped up. They bought out their own, turn like, for the longest time, Pioneer have been killing it with CDJs and mixers, not to mention, like, home hi-fi and whatnot. Uh, but they'd never really ventured into the turntable market, but once word got out that Technics were going to stop making turntables, trust me, Technics, th this model turntable, the 1200-1210, has been the go-to mix, uh, go-to turntable for the last 30 years, maybe more, right? You know, they've had variations on it. This is the Mark V not much difference between the Mark II to the Mark V, to be honest with you. There's quite a little bit of a jump from the Mark I to the Mark II, but it's little things, like there's a button here that allows me to lock the pitch. Um, you know, other than that, there is a brand new model that's just come out, the Mark VII's, and that's involved a whole overhaul. Like, Technics were like, you know what, we're getting back in the game. Um, they look sick. They're completely blacked out, all murdered out. You've got more control over your pitch, there's a reverse functionality in it. Um, they've upgraded the cables. They've internally grounded it, which is like about time, man. You know, sort that out. But the way these turntables work, I don't, I don't know if you've ever had a look underneath the platter. 
Now, traditional turntables back in the day, like my, my dad's home hi-fi when I first started collecting vinyl was what we called belt drive. Now, what that meant was there was a little motor in the corner here and it had a belt that went round the underside of the platter and that spanned the turntable. Now, what that meant was it was all good if all you're doing is listening to music, yeah? But the second you touched it, it went all over the place. They were real sensitive. They were prone to the belts stretching, which meant that the turntables weren't spinning at the right rate. Um, and, you know, they're just no good for DJing. Like, they're real flimsy. The way these work, now this is gonna, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have to pull this off one second. Now, it's actually an electromagnet holding it in place. Because I've had them on for a while, it takes a minute for the charge to dissipate. Oh, I can't get that off. Hang on. We'll get, we'll get there. We'll get there. Hang on. You know what? I'm not going to force it. Um, eventually, like if you give that like 10, 15 minutes or so, they will come off. They come off quite easily. But the idea, the way these work is, like I say, it's an electromagnet underneath this turntable. It's a real solid, sturdy platform. They've got like a thick rubber base and uh, rubber mounted feet, which stops feedback. But um, the idea with the electromagnet underneath the turntable is that there's no touching part, right? The magnet, it, it's this, you know, you know how the Japanese do. Japan, it, like, Technics is actually a, brow, uh, uh, a subset of Panasonic. And it's the same technology that the Japanese use to build the bullet train. Now, if you know how the bullet train works is the track is magnetized and there is an opposite magnet on the train. So when they, when they power it up, the train actually floats above the track. There's, n there's zero contact. And, you know, by s turning on one magnet and turning off the next one, it pulls the train along with it, right? That's what they're using in these turntables. It's the same technology. So because of that, because there's no motor directly connected to the platter, there's no belt, it's a real trustworthy platform for playing vinyl on and also because th because there's no mechanical moving parts you don't get any noise interference it's less things to go wrong it's one of the reasons these turntables have lasted as long as they have and that's proprietary technology uh, which is why competition just hasn't been able to step to them now Vestax do make a real decent turntable theirs is also what we call direct drive but theirs is literally a motor attached to the platter um, which if you're into scratching, it's really sick because you get nice high torque out of it and they give you much wider pitch control. Now, uh, if, you're, if you're wondering what I'm talking about, but about pitch control, by the way, uh, yeah, again, like I said, I'm kind of assuming that if you're watching this, you already have a basic understanding of what how DJing works. But pitch control is adjusting the speed of the rotation of the platter, right? Or in other words, slowing down or speeding up the track so that you can mix them. Now, I'll show you that in real time. Uh, let me bring this camera over so you can see. Right, and yeah, on the zoom, you can't really see that. Hang on, let me, uh, there we go, that's better. Okay. So on the turntable, when the turntable is spinning, you've got this, uh, this slider here, right? Now when it's in the middle, or if I press that button, it locks it at zero. What that means is that the track is spinning at the intended speed. That's the speed that they made the track in the first place, you know. But when you're mixing two tracks over each other and you need to match the speeds of the track, the, the BPM is the term that we use, beats per minute, you might either have to slow down or speed it up to match the tracks, yeah. So the pitch adjust on a Technics turntable gives you a range of plus or minus 8%, yeah? So bringing it this way slows it down and you can actually hear it. And then if I speed it up, Now, when I'm actually playing off of real vinyl, I try not to venture too far away from the zero point. Because as you can hear, when I speed it up, 
it literally changes the pitch of the sound. It makes it higher pitch. And when I slow it down, it slows it down, right? It lowers the pitch. And if you're playing off a real vinyl, it, it, I don't like the way it makes the track sound. A good thing about using Serato is that there's a, uh, a pitch lock functionality in there. So if you're looking at the uh, Serato screen, just above the, uh, the rotating dial here, there's a button that looks like a musical note. Uh, and if I click that, now if I can still speed up and slow down the track, but the pitch doesn't shift. I'll show you what I mean. See, it's slower, but you can still hear that it's at the same pitch, yeah? And if I speed it up, the same thing applies, yeah? So uh, that's real handy if you really need to make extreme pitch adjustments, you know? Again, like I say, I don't really like to venture too far from how the track was made because I feel like it's a disservice to the, uh, the artist that made the original track. All right, let me, let me adjust this back. So anyway, there's, uh, there's quite a lot of fiddling when it comes to setting up a proper turntable. Yeah, and in fact, I'm going to have to put this back again. So this is what we call the tone arm. Comes out of the turntable. You've got the head shell here. Okay, so let me take this off. There is a lot of room for things to go wrong when you're using needles or cartridges or styluses or vinyl in general, right? So first and foremost, the very tip, there is a diamond tip stylus on the end of that. Can you see that? All right. Um, I don't know if the, uh, the camera can make out the resolution, but look, there's a tiny little tip on the end of that. They break first. They go off and depend. It's one of those things. It's not necessarily the years, it's the mileage. Now I'm a scratch DJ, so I tend to batter these a lot. Um, and it works both ways. Not only does it get batter your needle, it batters the vinyl as well. These vinyls get tore up, you know, and I have to replace them quite regularly. Uh, there's, there's a whole pile of retired Serato vinyl over in the corner there. Uh, the good thing about Serato, you know, with original vinyl, that they took the brunt of it. You had to, you, you would ruin records just by scratching with them over and over and over again. And many records I would end up having to buy again or multiple copies of just because I knew I was going to ruin them, <laughs> you know. But there's different options you can get in cartridges and styluses. But just in that whole little setup there, you've got the stylus, you've got the cartridge, you've got the head shell. There's cables connecting the cartridge to these four connecting points on the back of it, right? And then that goes into the arm, right? But then also, there's a lot of failure points within this system. The arm can break. The cables from your turntable to your mixer could be mash up, right? Um, all of this causes mag problems when you're DJing with Serato because Serato relies on you having a clean, crisp signal for the laptop to interpret, right? So... I want to send a shout out to the, hang on, I'm just, uh, I just got to change this setup one sec. So there's a company out there who launched a new product just last year called Phase. I don't know if you know about Phase, but Phase have changed the game. Now what Phase has allowed Serato DJs, especially vinyl Serato DJs to do, is, um, is to eliminate the needle completely. Now the way Phase works is, let me show you this, yeah. That's the phase unit right there, right? Now I've got this little charging base unit, which is this, yeah? So you can see there's another one there. You get one for each turntable. Um, and these, this base unit acts as a charging unit and also connects to the back of the mixer to send audio. But rather than using the vinyl and the needle, we use these, right? So you see this, the light, oh, hang on, let me, uh, So if I, uh, when you buy the phase units, they've got magnets on the bottom of them and you get this little magnetic strip that you put on your vinyl. 
put that on the vinyl. You see where that hole is? Can you see that? There's a hole there. If I shine that to the light, you can, yeah. But that sits on the turntable like that. Give it a second, it calibrates its signal. And uh, if I've done this right. Look at that. Look, the needle's not on the record. The way it works, there's actually gyroscopes in there, like you have in your phone, so it knows which way up it is. Uh, I actually assumed it worked off of Bluetooth. It turns out it's actually radio frequencies it uses. But that unit, once it's calibrated, you put it in, you sit it on the deck while it's not spinning, it calibrates itself, and then it sends a radio signal to its base unit, which in turn sends the signal to the laptop. And it's a beautiful, crisp signal. There's no distortion, you know, and there's... I mean, it's not to say that they can't go wrong. They can go wrong. They can run out of batteries. They can be miscalibrated. But in, for the most part, these things have changed the game because now, you know, I can... Nothing happens. It doesn't bounce. You know what I mean? I'm banging away on that and, and it's, it's wicked. It works, right? And uh, you get two of them because you need one for each turntable. And now, so instead of using the needle, the cartridge, the head shell, the turntable, all of that to send the signal to the laptop, like I say, they've got multiple failure points. The phase is really reliable and trustworthy. And so, you know, especially when you're playing out at like festivals or, you know, sometimes the stages are really bouncy and there's so much feedback and the needles are jumping about all over the place. And me as a DJ, I like to jump about and dance when I'm spinning, you know what I mean? The amount of times I've been jumping about and you knock the turntable, the needle goes flying and, you know, you look like a, you look, you, 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 <laughs> I'm not going to swear, but you look like an amateur, you know what I mean? <laughs> you know, um, so these have changed the game, you know, so shout out to FaZe. They are introducing on their next firmware update you don't have to even have it connected to the mixer. As long as it's connected to your laptop, uh, the Serato will pick up the signal. We'll get we'll get in more into that in some of the uh, the later seminars. You know what I'm saying? Just to give you an understanding of m the more complicated side of the technology. You know, right? So, so yeah, we're getting there. All right, what have we got? What time is it? Okay, we got about 15 minutes before we get out of here. Uh, shout out once again to everyone that's been checking us out. Big up to you guys out there. Who we got? Uh, yeah, try Ketra. What are you saying? Yeah, yeah, big up. Uh, okay, so DJing, like I say, I've gone through my setup here. This is my butter setup that I'm most happy and content DJing with. And But one thing you've got to be prepared for as a DJ is when you go out, you may not encounter your ideal setup. In fact, more than likely, you are not going to have the setup that you would choose to use by preference. Now, a lot of the stuff that I've been talking about is kind of specific to my setup here, but a lot of it is transferable as well. Understanding what the faders do, understanding how to use the EQs, understanding the pitch control. You know, this is all fundamentals when it comes to DJing. And, uh, you know, when we get into mixing a little bit more, I'm going to actually practically show you how that stuff works. Um, but having an have a if you have a basic understanding of how one setup works, you basically understand how they all work. And a good DJ is able to adapt to whatever is in front of them. I see a lot of DJs out there that, you know, look, you do whatever suits you, you know, uh, but uh, like they like to take their own mixers or a controller or, you know, a controller is not so bad because you're pretty self-contained. It's you, your laptop and your controller, and you can plug that into an audio. Uh, you know, if you have to plug in another mixer, that can be a real pain in the ass. Uh, excuse my language. But uh, it is a problem because you've got to start disconnecting all of this. You've got to pull that out. You've got to put the other one in. You've got to make sure there's room for it. You know, what I'm trying to say is don't be so precious. You know, the, one of the only reasons that people like to use their own equipment is because they want to show off, right? But that's just ego. You know, end of the day, you know, in most cases, you're, you're, you're being hired to do a job. Right. I say to a lot of people that I teach when I went about DJing until you're like some big name DJ where they have paid just to come and see you DJ. Like uh, the, an example I could give is, say, Andy C from Ram Records, you know, Andy C and Ram Records. They just celebrated 25 years and, he, you know, he's did like a seven hour set at Wembley Arena. 
and you know tickets were like a hundred quid but a sandy sea you know what i mean and people knew what they were getting they knew what they were going to see they wanted to see andy c tearing it up on three decks killing it with the dmb yeah but for the most part i mean most of my bookings no one is specifically coming to see me dj like even when i'm spinning at chip shop you know i i do get props you know people are like oh sick you're spinning tonight nice one wicked you know but they were going to come anyway you know and when when you're DJing at a venue like a bar or a small club or something like that, you've got to remember it's a job, yeah? You're, you're being hired by someone to do a job. And when it comes to any job, whatever you do, whether it's DJing, anything artistic, or, you know, whether it's an office job, right? Th the fundamental point is do a good job and be reliable, right? And then the work will come to you. You will never want for work. You will always do well, you know? And the same applies when you're DJing. So... If I've been, to use my own experience as an example, let's say I'm doing a standard four hours at chip shop, you know, on a Friday or a Saturday night, that would be normally, you know, nine till 1 a.m. And, um, you know, I love chip shop. And in that four hours, I get to do a lot of different stuff. You know, I'm essentially my own warm-up DJ. You've got to be aware that, it's not always peak time. You're not always going to be the headline DJ, right? So, you know, when it's 9 o'clock, 10 o'clock, people are still eating, the kitchen's still open, people are chilling, they're ordering drinks and hanging out. So I keep it pretty chilled. I keep it, you know, kind of vibesy, you know. And to be honest, I enjoy that because I, I can use that time to explore music that I can't play later on, you know, because it's not a hype tune and you know people aren't drunk yet or they're not necessarily dancing to it you're just playing the music you know what i mean I, I i really enjoy those sets you know uh and then conversely once it gets to 11 o'clock midnight now the drinks are flying the kitchen's closed they've cleared away the table the dance floor is open now it's party time right so you've got to flip up the uh flip up the vibes and turn it into a party and bring the vibes in that way but also this is true you know, just in across the board when it comes to DJing, you know, when it comes to radio DJs, more often than not, a lot of, you know, stations are looking for personalities more than they're looking for DJs. They want people, like, if it's a drive time show or a breakfast wake up show, they want the, hey, how you doing? They want the, you know, the crazy zany, you know, personality. They don't care if you know how to mix two records together because that's not what they're looking for. But um, then on the same tip, when you get into some late night specialist, you know, like, John Peel, the late, great John Peel, R.I.P. John Peel, he was a big inspiration to me as a DJ. I used to love listening to his show on Radio 1. And one of the reasons for it was is he used to play such a variety of music, but you would never know what he was going to play next, right? But one thing that he would, you, you, you were almost guaranteed was whatever he played you, it was going to be sick. You know, it was, at the t it was at the top of its game, whether it was rock, heavy metal, drum and bass, hip hop, like reggae. Like my man went in on every genre and it was always the best music. You know, so R.I.P. John Peel. That's why they named a the stage after him at the Glastonbury Festival. Um, I'd say a good counterpart for him now is the guy who took over the show. And that's Giles Peterson, you know. And, um, you know, so you've got these like late night specialist shows. That's me. If I could, uh, you know. If if I had a show on like Radio One or something like that, I'd want that. I'd want to do like a radio, like late night specialist show. Now you know I've got a history in radio. I still host a weekly show. I do the Chip Shop show on uh, Rap Station Three Six Five for my man Chuck D, Big Up Public Enemy, and uh, we, we rep UK hip hop. But you know I started off on Pirate Radio, and uh, you know it was playing house, garage, drum and bass, that kind of stuff. And um, you have to adjust your style depending on the environment that you're in and the platform that you're on. Always be aware of that and be aware of your audience. You know, don't let your ego get the, get the better of you. Like I say, it's a job. You're being hired to entertain the audience, you know, and they're the ones that are keeping you in work by showing the venue their patronage and spending their money. And if you do a good job and you're killing it and they're having a great time, they're going to come back. Right. They're going to they're going to stay. They're going to spend money. They're going to have a good time. and They're going to come back. And, you know, managers left happy. You know, he's like, yep, you killed it. I will see you next week. And then you before you know, it, you got a regular booking. You know what I'm saying? And, um, y y you know, like I say, it's really important to understand your audience, where you're playing, what you're playing, how you're playing it, you know. And uh, don't let ego get the better of you. You know, I see a lot of DJs get consumed by ego. I'm not playing that. I'm not playing that. Look. 
I'll be real with you. If you want to make a living out of being a DJ, you know, you take the gigs where you can get them. You know, I hope to one day, of course, like everyone else, man. You know, we all dream of being superstar DJs, but the reality is, is every now and then you're going to have to do a wedding. You're going to have to do a birthday party, you know, uh, or some sort of gig that you don't, wouldn't normally play at. But I never don't enjoy them. You know, I, I make a point of enjoying every gig I do. If I'm playing at a wedding or if I'm playing at a party, it's more often than not than it, like someone who knows what kind of DJ I am already. And, you know, I make a point of, yeah, I'll flip up the music a little bit, make it a little bit more family friendly, make it a little bit more chart worthy or whatever. But I still have fun doing it. I don't play music that I don't enjoy. That's rule number one, you know, and um I, that, that should be the same for you guys as well. Like everything in life, if it stops being fun, stop doing it, you know, or if you, it, it, you know, or find a way to find the joy, you know what I mean? So, um, you know, that's, where are we at? We've got just over five minutes left now. Um, once again, big up to everyone that's been uh, watching on the Instagram. This is going to go up on YouTube once we're done. Uh, this is happening every week, every Thursday, 4 till 5 p.m., um, once again, shout out to the whole Soapbox team. Big up to Nick, big up James, the whole crew behind the scenes. Big up to the mics, big up Jamil. You know what I mean? You know, we're offering podcasting, games design, uh, music production. I think video editing is on the cards. There's a whole heap of stuff going on. So if you want to find out more about what we're doing, hit up the website, soapboxislington.org. Um, and yeah, on the socials, I believe Twitter is soap underscore underscore box on instagram we are at soapbox islington i'm at dj shorty 79 you can uh, follow me if you want to you don't have to and um yeah man th 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 there's going to be a lot of stuff going on over the next few weeks so make sure you get involved learn some new skills you know what i mean and be like, right, look so before we get out of here what we got we got about five six minutes left yeah yeah i'll sh 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 show you a little something yeah you want to see some cutting some scratching yeah okay hang on, let's do this hang on, i'm gonna get this mic out of the way for a second So there's a saying in the, in the world of DJing, you know, we call ourselves turntablists. And um, the reason for that is, look, if you play a piano, you're a pianist. You play a guitar, you're a guitarist. You play a violin, you're a violinist, yeah? But we play the turntables, so we are turntablists. We play the turntables like it's a musical instrument, you know. We're dealing in timing and structure, all of that, right? So... Just to quickly go over, I'm going to, you know, incorporate what I was talking about earlier and what I'm going to do now. I've got the same track loaded up on both turntables, but uh, I'm going to run the beat section on this turntable and I'm going to use some s samples and sound effects on this turntable to scratch over it. Much like in a band, a guitarist or an instrumentalist might solo over a drummer. You know what I mean? And, um, yeah, man, all right, let's, let's get into this. Let me run the beat. Hang on, so... All right, there's the beat. So I like to add a little bit of echo to my scratches. There we go, there we go.
get an idea of what I'm talking about right you know so by you know I'll get into the technicals of how to uh, how to scratch later if you want to learn how to scratch and you know uh, we've got just under two minutes remaining on the uh, Instagram live stream so just to quickly break it down on this turntable over here I've got the beat running and then on this turntable on the left uh, I've got a sequence of sound effects uh, these ones I've got ready it goes up uh, but it's fresh There you go, people. That was seminar number one of six on how to become a better DJ. Uh, big up to the whole Soapbox team. I've been DJ Shorty. Uh, find me right here every Thursday, 4 till 5 p.m. at Soapbox Islington. I'm at DJ Shorty 79. Until next week, uh, this is DJ Shorty signing out. Peace.